Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Alyssa Frank, and I am the Pedestrian Bicycle Coordinator here at the Palm Beach Transportation Planning Agency. I'm very excited to have this webinar today. It is in honor of Florida Bicycle Month, and we are going to be partnering with our friends at the Dutch Cycling Embassy for this. So I would like to take a moment and introduce Chris Brentlin. Um, he is the Marketing and Communications Manager at the Dutch Cycling Embassy, which is a public-private partnership that represents the best knowledge, experience, and experts from the Netherlands. As a longtime campaigner in Vancouver, he fell in love with the Dutch bike culture in 2016, inspiring him to co-author the book, Building the Cycling City, the Dutch Blueprint for Urban Vitality. Chris uses his knowledge and passion to share practical lessons for global cities wishing to follow their footsteps and become better places to live, work, and of course, cycle. With that, I would like to hand it over to Chris to go through the presentation. And very quickly, um, we will be doing questions and answers afterwards. If a question comes to mind, feel free to send it in the Q&A uh, chat box at the bottom and we will address it at the end of the webinar. Thank you. And Chris, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Alyssa. Good morning, everyone, and greetings from across the Atlantic. It is three o'clock in the afternoon here but uh, bright and early for you guys. So appreciate you getting up and uh, spending some time with me this morning. I'm going to uh, jump right in with my presentation. Um, so thanks again to Alyssa for inviting me, providing this uh, opportunity to spotlight the Netherlands as a cycling nation and, and to hopefully share some information and inspiration with you all. Uh, the Palm Beach Transportation Planning Agency has been a, a valued partner with the DC for uh, quite some time now, uh, coordinating a number of events, uh, both public and, and private events for their, their staff and consultants, uh, and also in coordination with the, the Netherlands Embassy in Miami, um, who have been a, another valued partner in that part of the world. We've obviously all been doing virtual uh, exchanges at this moment in time, but hoping to uh, to start doing some physical events uh, in the in the months ahead. So, without further ado, I'll just introduce myself briefly. As Alyssa said, yes, I'm not in fact Dutch, but I have the immense privilege of promoting the Netherlands as uh, a model, a a a a uh, laboratory, if you will, uh, for cities and regions around the world that are looking to get their kickstart their own cycling culture. I myself moved to the Netherlands three years ago with my family uh, to the small town of Delft. Uh, and uh, having written a book in 2018 about uh, uh, what we learned from uh, the Netherlands during a five week tour there in the summer of 2016 and what other uh, American and Canadian cities could potentially learn from those less uh, learn lessons from uh, from those stories. Uh, and also provide some practical examples of cities like uh, New York, Seattle, Austin, Texas, that I'll talk about today. They're actually translating some of these principles uh, under their own streets. My wife and I, Melissa, have since wrote a second book called Curbing Traffic. Um, that's a bit more of a personal story, how our family settled uh, the first year in the Netherlands. Uh, and, but a, a larger story about how the city of Delft itself um, built uh, some cycling infrastructure and some uh, auto lieu or low car policies to make a really uh, amazing living environment for the people that live there of all ages, all abilities, uh, and all economic backgrounds. And uh, a lot of the material I'll be talking about today draws from those two books. So the Dutch Cycling Embassy, what is it and, and what exactly do we do? Well, we're a nonprofit that was uh, initiated 10 years ago by the national government here in the Netherlands by the Ministry of Infrastructure specifically to export the knowledge and expertise that exists here, act as an intermediary between uh, 50 years of, of transport planning uh, um, and uh, the demand for that from cities and regions around the world. So we uh, work in a variety of ways and we have draw from our network of 85 different organizations from both the public and private sector. So we have consultants, uh, we have uh, bicycle manufacturers, bicycle parking manufacturers, technology companies, uh, but also from the public sector, we're able to draw from expertise from the municipalities, provinces, um, the public transport agencies, including the train uh, uh, operators here, uh, and able to bring experts to the table to address uh, whatever challenges 
that, uh, that we're being asked about largely work in two ways. So we host a lot of study visits here to the Netherlands. We bring decision makers, engineers, planners to uh, the Netherlands and show them uh, relatable Dutch cities that are similar size and context, uh, get them on a bicycle, get them inspired and, and to ride the infrastructure here, and then also take them in a classroom setting and help them understand what they saw uh, and what is potentially translatable when they get back to their hometown. Inversely, we do what we call uh, think bike workshops, which are uh, bringing teams of Dutch ex experts uh, overseas to other cities and regions and to work on specific challenges, whether it's high level network planning or intersection design or bicycle parking design, um, working on specific case studies with local consultants to teach them the skills that they need uh, to start implementing some of these measures themselves. But the first thing we always ask when we get uh, an inquiry and we start working with a new city is um, what can the bicycle do for you? It's not enough to just grow cycling for the sake of growing cycling. More cycling is nice to have, but it should be used as a tool, a policy tool uh, and a mobility tool to help you achieve the larger goals of your city. And I've listed here, uh, you know, about a dozen uh, ways that the bicycle can contribute to uh, your livability of your city, the equity of your city, uh, the safety of your city, the social cohesion of your city. Uh, and it's really up to the cities to strategize how best they can leverage these opportunities and design and build this infrastructure to achieve those end goals. The goals, of course, are not to build a car-free city, but to build a multimodal city where walking, cycling, public transportation, and yes, cars and electric cars all work together to provide their citizens with the tools they need to move around their city safely and comfortably. But that's the Netherlands we often hear. That has no relationship to where I'm from or uh, you know, the, the cities that we have built in our country. Uh, and I think it's often uh, interesting to do a contextual comparison to look at uh, not individual Dutch cities, but uh, the larger conglomeration in here specifically, I've. Uh, shone a spotlight on the Randstad region, which is uh, translates to uh, edge city or circular city. And it's a circular conglomeration of the 25 municipalities here in the Netherlands that include the largest cities, Amsterdam, Utrecht, Rotterdam, The Hague, uh, the port of Rotterdam, which is the largest uh, in the European Union, Schiphol Airport, which is the second largest airport uh, in the EU. Uh, and when you compare that uh, metropolitan area, it is completely relatable to uh, a San Francisco, a London, a Paris, uh, uh, and, and many other cities. I've provided some, some point of comparison for the metropolitan Miami area. Again, it's not a perfect um, uh, uh, comparison, but I think as Miami hopefully starts to densify and, and grow upwards rather than grow outwards, um, there may be more similarities, but obviously the big difference is how people move around and and the Randstad itself has achieved a more of a, uh, a balance between its, uh, its uh, modes of transport, where obviously uh, a lot of American cities and other cities around the world are quite uh, dependent on their automobiles. So I want to take a moment to just acknowledge the very unique moment that we find ourselves in here uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. It has really accelerated uh, what was happening on our streets uh, quite slowly uh, at the turn of the 21st century uh, and made us really question uh, how our mobilities, our mobility networks work and how uh, space is allocated on our streets. And it started during lockdown with uh, the creation of what a lot of cities called slow streets, that is traffic calm spaces for people to get outside, move their bodies, uh, get social contact with their, their fellow neighbors and access to nature and uh, and with an understanding that uh, that as a uh, uh, for our physical and mental health, we require these types of spaces to move our bodies and, and meet other people. As cities started coming out of lockdown, there were a lot of temporary cycling infrastructure, a lot of scrambling to create pop up bike lanes or or uh, or the like, um, and that was in a direct response to a very simple geometric problem. That is. Uh, that cities like London, like Paris, like uh, Berlin, suddenly had a reduced capacity and attractiveness of their public transport systems. Far fewer people wanted to or were able to, due to social distancing, ride the buses, trams, and trains. And if just a, a fraction of those people jumped into 
uh, their cars on top of existing traffic, the use of, of the car as a piece of personal protective equipment would be a huge problem in terms of added congestion, pollution, uh, and, and all of the externalities that come with increased car use. So cities went about very quickly to create uh, additional modes of transport, alternatives to that lost public transportation trips. Uh, and in the EU here, it resulted in over 1.7 billion euros of investments and over 2,600 kilometers of temporary infrastructure that is now uh, gradually being transformed into permanent infrastructure. But there was one country that wasn't doing a lot during the pandemic. And I think on the surface, uh, that can be surprising. But when you dig a little bit deeper, it makes perfect sense because the Netherlands uh, already reallocated the space on its streets uh, some time ago and, and rebalanced its mobility system to make sure that there were alternatives if one single modality uh, didn't was, was suddenly removed and outside shock uh, came, came, to, uh, came to be. But that was actually, uh, interestingly, uh, in response to uh, a very similar crisis in the, in the 1970s uh, that set about their uh, urban planning and transport planning uh, in a very different direction than, than many other places in the world. That is, uh, there was a road safety crisis in, the 19, in 1972 that came to a head with the Stop the Kinder movement, the Stop Child Murder movement, that was families on the street protesting the rise of automobiles, traffic, uh, and uh, demanding more from their elected officials. Uh, and in the following year, a, a six-week oil crisis that uh, resulted in, in gas prices skyrocketing, the, the sale of bicycles doubled, uh, and people suddenly saw the amount of space in their cities they had handed over to the, the private car uh, and, and demanded, again, demanded more from their city officials to start uh, reprioritizing how they uh, moved around their cities. There was also a recognition from the national government here that, uh, again, one single modality, a car-based system, uh, does not uh, is very fragile to outside shock, whether it's a gasoline uh, shortage, whether it's uh, extreme weather conditions, whether it's a global pandemic, and, and that by building uh, a more balanced and, and diverse mobility system, they would be set up uh, quite well to deal with the crises ahead, such as the COVID crisis that we've just experienced, or the, the current spike in, in gasoline prices that we are experiencing thanks to uh, Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. That isn't to say that the path to uh, Feats Paradise or, or Cycling Utopia was smooth and, and easy. There were a lot of mistakes made along the way because there was no guidebook how to do this. There was no design manual that existed. Uh, and so demonstration projects that were initiated by the national government in two cities, in Tilburg and in The Hague, uh, were very quickly deemed to be failures from the business community, from the cycling community, uh, from the media. Uh, because they were individual routes that didn't connect anything to anything and, and uh, they weren't really done in consultation with the business community. Uh, in one instance in The Hague, the, uh, the entrepreneurs, the shop owners hired construction workers to rip out the cycle track in the middle of the night and uh, there were a lot of lessons learned through that process as you can imagine. So with the third, the third kick of the can, um, the national government went to the municipality of Delft where I uh, currently live and um, uh, slightly changed their tactics a little bit. And this is where they came up with the, uh, the understanding that they had to take a more holistic approach to their cycle planning. It wasn't enough to just build individual routes that uh, didn't connect anything to anywhere. Uh, they, they looked at the city as a, a grid or a series of grids. Uh, and by talking to the people in that city, by doing a, a very broad public engagement process, um, they learned where people traveled within their city, not just from their house to their office, but to their school, to their restaurants, to friends' houses, to the public transportation facilities, uh, all across the city. And they were able to design not one single uh, cycling network, but actually three uh, of varying uh, usages. So the, uh, the red network there that you can see has a larger grid and is designed for longer distance trips, maybe the, the commute to the office. Uh, a slightly smaller grid is the bluer network, which is designed for mid-size journeys within the city, maybe going to the city center to go shopping. Uh, and then the green routes were the really fine grain routes um, that would be used for much shorter distances to the corner store or to uh, for the kids to get to school. 
And by taking this broader approach, they were able to develop these five principles that we now take to cities around the world uh, when they're planning their cycle networks, because there's an understanding that these networks have to be direct, they have to be safe, they have to be comfortable, they have to be cohesive, and they have to be attractive. And if you check all of those boxes, uh, then you can expect cycling uh, numbers to grow exponentially. But you can't ignore the weakest link. And, and this is another important lesson that came from this trial and error process, is if you're building protected cycling facilities as, as they do on the arterial roads here in the Netherlands, you can't just give up at the intersection. There has to be a continuation of this physical protection through junctions, through roundabouts, and across side streets uh, to ensure that these uh, vulnerable road users, not just the cyclists, but also the pedestrians, are in a raised, continuous, uh, and seamless space. And so you often see uh, at intersections, the protected intersection, which means that there are uh, co corner bulb outs uh, where the car has to almost do a full 90 degree turn uh, and visually acknowledge the cyclist and pedestrian that this reduces the, the chance of a right hook, which is one of the more common uh, bike uh, car collisions. And then every time this arterial road crosses a side street, the foot and the cycle path uh, continues through the intersection, uh, as you can see in the photo on the bottom there, in this raised position so that the cars have to come up into the uh, the walking and cycling space instead of the pedestrians and cyclists stepping down into the car space. And it just removes any sense of entitlement for uh, the drivers in that quite critical uh, point. The other thing that uh, Dutch cities uh, uh, began to understand during that period of time is it's not enough to just make cycling uh, attractive, you also have to make driving a little bit uh, inconvenient and indirect. And by creating a hierarchy of streets, that is, there's only uh, three categories of streets here in the Netherlands, uh, national roads, local distributor roads, and then local access streets, each with their own corresponding speed limit and, um, and uh, type of cycling infrastructure, that you can um, create a, a traffic circulation plan that is pushing the traffic away from sensitive residential and commercial areas uh, and making uh, walking and cycling much more direct uh, and therefore more time competitive within the city. And people are more likely to choose it in that, in that instance, uh, but you also make those routes much safer uh, and, and uh, livable uh, for the people that happen to live and work and shop along them. Uh, I, I said the phrase speed limit earlier, and I think this is an important distinction that, again, the Netherlands figured out quite uh, quickly, that it's not just enough to put a, uh, a 30 or a 50 kilometer sign up on the street and then hope for the best, because um, the police can't be everywhere to enforce everything, uh, the speed limit all the time. And drivers are just going to do uh, the speed that they feel comfortable at, that the design of the street dictates. So if you do want uh, reduce speeds on your streets, then you have to engineer measures measures that um, trick drivers almost into slowing down and, and paying attention. And that can be done through uh, chicanes on the, on the corners, um, creating a more serpentine pattern, a change in texture, speed tables or speed bumps. Uh, and with the understanding that if there's too many drivers speeding on a street, it's not an enforcement issue, it's an engineering issue, a design issue. Uh, and that street is sent back to the drawing board uh, for the engineers to ensure that uh, um, the that you're designing for the behavior that you want. Another more recent development uh, here in the Netherlands has been the combination of cycling and public transport. And this is really uh, almost was discovered by accident in the early 2000s. Uh, the sea of, of bicycle parking uh, that you now see at Dutch train stations began as as uh, not as a specific policy decision, but just a, a recognition that more and more train uh, users were cycling to the train station. And by creating secure, free, uh, supervised bike parking, uh, such as the one you see here in Rotterdam, but you're seeing more and more futuristic, uh, beautiful designs of, uh, of bike parking facilities. The one here uh, by our office in Utrecht uh, has 12,500 bicycle parking uh, places. Uh, you're facilitating this door-to-door -door convenience uh, that, that can compete with the car because the bicycle itself does not have the range of the automobile um, and the, the public transport systems, whether they're, they're buses, uh, trams or trains, cannot 
pick you up at your front door and deliver you directly to your destination. But if you provide that cycling uh, option through the infrastructure and the parking uh, for the first and last mile of your public transportation trip, then you can provide that same door-to-door -door convenience, extend people's range and allow them to travel. Uh, well, I, I work 65 kilometers, uh, 45 miles, uh, from my office and and travel there car free every day using this bike train uh, bike combination, and it's uh, really been uh, a success story here. And in, insofar as it delivers not just more train customers, uh, public transport users onto the the trams, buses, and trains, but also creates more cyclists. A, a, almost a quarter of all kilometers cycled in Dutch cities are to or from. A train station. So there's this vicious, uh, sorry, virtuous, virtuous circle uh, of sustainable transport that uh, that happens when you treat bikes and and transport public transport as uh, allies rather than as competitors. The electric bike has been another really kind of transformational tool. Again, a more recent one, uh, and and. Um, it's not a coincidence that the Netherlands is actually the largest e-bike market in the world per capita. That is, they've embraced the e-bike more than any other country, despite the fact that they're as flat as a pancake. So um, you are seeing, uh, it started with uh, the elderly population, uh, uh, allowing them to maintain their mobility in older age, and then uh, permeated to allow other people uh, options to travel further and further distances. So it's not necessarily being used to travel faster. The average speed of an e-bike versus a traditional bike here is only two or three kilometers per hour more, but it's extending the range, allowing them to travel. Well, in, in this case, uh, the average e-bike trip is almost twice as much as is on a traditional bicycle. And it's leading to uh, the creation of these longer distance cycling routes, what they call snell feats routes or fast cycling routes that allow you to travel from city to city, 15, 20, excuse me, 25 kilometers uh, with a, a much wider, smoother, more direct route, and often giving the cyclists priority at intersections so that you can cycle between Arnhem and Nijmegen, for example, which is a 15 kilometer journey without having to put your foot down once. Uh, and then last but not least is the, the soft side of things. So of course the, the infrastructure is important, the policy is important, um, but you need to uh, get uh, get your citizens cycling and get them cycling at a very early age. And here it, it begins uh, at the age of 10 insofar as traffic safety education that takes place in the classroom. Uh, first, it's in-class exercises, uh, but then eventually right before in their last year of elementary school, uh, before they go to high school, there's a, a practical exam that children get on their bicycle and they uh, cycle through their city with the parents um grading them parents volunteers grading them uh, and if they successfully pass this uh, this practical exam which is taken by 200,000 students each and every year it's uh, right across the country uh, they're, they're presented with a diploma and they're ready to proceed to high school and and the additional cycling uh, that perhaps that entails so all of these measures yeah i think have, have resulted in uh, what is quite a remarkable success story Again, not a, a car-free society by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, a society that's embraced the bicycle, famously the only country in the world with more bicycles than people, um, but perhaps more impressive is the amount that those bicycles are used. And uh, at last count, it was 17.6 billion kilometers that the Netherlands collectively cycles uh, each and every year. That is over a thousand kilometers per capita uh, and 202 municipalities across the country, the, the bicycle mode share is, is uh, higher than the car mode share. So everybody cycles here from child, children to the elderly, people with physical disabilities, uh, obviously more women than men cycle here. Uh, and uh, it's not seen as a, a, uh, a part of people's personalities, their identities, a political statement. It is just a, a normal way to move around the city. Uh, it's just a slightly faster way of, of walking. Uh, we often say. In response to that road safety crisis in the 1970s, uh, well, they've, uh, they've made uh, the Netherlands one of the uh, safest places in the world to walk and cycle. Uh, and I think this is uh, perhaps shocking to compare to the United States because the US was, of course, 
uh, also subject to the same OPEC oil crisis, but uh, did not make the same adjustments to their uh, road safety policies, to their street design policies, to their mobility networks. And as a result, uh, you're more than 10 times more likely to uh, die uh, on foot or bicycle uh, in the United States than you are here in the Netherlands. And uh, we know the principles, we know the ways to uh, to get there. The, the decision now largely is, is political and, and convincing engineers that uh, safety needs to prior, be prioritized over speed and comfort of drivers. All kinds of uh, adverse, uh, or so to say positive effects to uh, to this cycling culture, not the least of which is the, the health savings. 5.9 billion euros per year is saved to the Dutch healthcare system uh, just because of the additional activity that's built into moving from A to B. The Netherlands is the only EU country that will re reverse its obesity rate. Uh, so if there's, uh, and there's obviously dozens of reasons to do this, but this one, that just makes great economic sense. And then the most perhaps counterintuitive argument to this whole uh, discussion is the fact that uh, it actually results in a better place for driving. Uh, and this was um, shown through uh, the Netherlands being named by Waze, the, the application, the digital app, the wayfinding app, for three consecutive years to be the most satisfying place in the world to be a driver. And it's specifically referenced uh, the low levels of congestion and the, the, the smooth road conditions. And largely it just proves that um, if you give people an alternative, if you give people choices for shirt journeys, largely within their city, uh, they will pick the mode that works for them. And, and by using the space on our streets slightly more efficiently in terms of the allocation of space, uh, counterintuitively, by taking some space away from cars, you can actually make it uh, better for drivers. You can free up that precious road space for people who want to drive and need to drive uh, and, and while providing options for everybody else. So if this is not a, a reason to build more cycling friendly cities, um, then I don't know what is. So again, we often hear, yeah, well, that's the Netherlands, uh, you know, that would never work here. Uh, our city is different, our culture is different, our terrain is different, our weather is different. Uh, so I just want to kind of run through some examples from uh, various cities that the Dutch Cycling Embassy has worked with uh, to show what is possible uh, in all kinds of different contexts. This is uh, the small ski resort uh, city of Canmore, Alberta, Canada, uh, in the Canadian Rockies, uh, quite a popular ski resort. Uh, but one of our uh, consultants, Mobicon, have been quite active there in terms of transferring these principles from the Netherlands uh, to these wide Canadian streets. And they've put in not just the glorious red cycle tracks that you can see here, uh, but fully implemented the protected intersection concept at busy six and eight lane arterials. Um, so it is uh, quite a, an amazing success story in a fairly cold and fairly hilly uh, Canadian climate. Uh, in Auckland, New Zealand, uh, they have taken the principles of the Crow Manual, that is the, uh, the book of, of, uh, for bicycle traffic design here in the Netherlands and applied it to uh, New Zealand context. And they've created a design, their own design guide for cities across New Zealand uh, to implement some of these ideas. And they range from protected roundabouts, protected intersections, to bicycle streets and segregated uh, bicycle traffic. It is uh, another great example of what's possible if you, uh, if you just think a little bit differently about uh, the way you allocate space on your streets. In Atlanta, Georgia, um, they are combining the, or looking at combining cycling and public transportation uh, in rather unique and, and creative ways. Uh, there was a recognition there by the regional planning authority that um, a significant amount of the population lives within an, uh, a fairly short bicycle ride of a, uh, a bus stop or a train stop. Uh, so they put together this uh, design guide uh, for the various municipalities across the greater Atlanta region uh, to start building infrastructure, to start allocating bike parking space, creating these mobility hubs where people can seamlessly transition from uh, cycling to public transport uh, and we're excited to see where that will hopefully uh, improve and, and reduce car dependence and increase access to opportunity in that part of the world. 
uh, in Los Angeles, one of our, our uh, consultants uh, called Bike Minded, they're based in Rotterdam. They're working with local engineers on the Los Angeles River project, a kind of a transformational uh, project. Uh, the, the former, uh, well, what is now a kind of a concrete gutter that runs through the city of Los Angeles. Uh, prior to the, the Olympics in 2028, I think it is, they're, they're hoping to get this uh, walking, cycling and, and uh, trail in place that involves a number of uh, creative bridge designs that are going to be uh, done by a Dutch design firm. Uh, and, and hopefully this will be a project that, yeah, is the legacy of the, the Olympic games going to that city. And then last but not least, uh, I hinted at Austin, Texas uh, earlier, and I think this is perhaps one of our uh, best and, and uh, under told success stories. We traveled to there uh, in 2012 to host a Think Bike workshop with uh, the city of Austin. Uh, and through that process, uh, while, by looking at uh, the short car journeys that happen in that city, that is uh, journeys under three miles, uh, we were able to plan a cycling network, a citywide cycling network that would capture uh, a, a number of those short car journeys and, and ultimately reduce uh, the need for a car and, and also uh, reduce the amount of congestion at very specific pinch points uh, on the city's road network. Uh, it was passed uh, through a ballot measure, the funding uh, for that, uh, and a bicycle master plan that is in the process of being built as we speak. They're about halfway through this process, uh, but it's a citywide network of 650 kilometers, so uh, 400 miles of uh, not just segregated cycling infrastructure, but also uh, mixed traffic conditions and, and uh, trails. Uh, and a lot of it is done in that kind of uh, red uh, Dutch style asphalt. So it's uh, Austin's quietly becoming potentially, uh, yeah, one of the great cycling cities in America. So I wanna wrap up today just by talking a little bit about the, the why, because um, I think right now we, um, uh, well, we've designed a lot of uh, uh, potential cycling users out of our streets by making them so hostile. Uh, and so the people currently cycling on our streets uh, in a lot of places are just the fit, the brave, uh, and the, the traffic tolerant that are willing to rub shoulders with uh, buses, trucks, and, and cars. And one thing that's really quite amazing about the Netherlands, as I was saying earlier, is the different demographics you see uh, on a bicycle uh, that shows us what's possible when we start uh, designing the networks, getting the intersection design right, uh, and making it comfortable for almost anyone to get on a bicycle. And, and, and I think it starts at a very early age. Um, I myself, as the father of two children, watch them um, spread their wings and, and really uh, discover a freedom and an autonomy uh, here in the Netherlands that, that they could not get in Canada because of the cycling infrastructure, because of the, uh, the amazing street design, they're cycling all over the city independently uh, and freely to meet friends, to go to school. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, really kind of a remarkable thing that, uh, uh, that Dutch parents are able to offer their children is, is the, the ability to get out from under their parents' supervision uh, not to have to drive them everywhere and, and, and drop them off uh, at activities. Uh, and it's not a coincidence that, uh, again, that UNICEF regularly ranks Dutch children as the happiest in the world because um, they're out there navigating their own city, not counting down the days till they uh, need a, a, a driver's license to, to get around. And uh, that, that being outside, that being with their friends, uh, that being control, uh, the control of their own mobility uh, it leads to not just happier, healthier kids, but more resilient kids as they're uh, out there making mistakes, learning from their mistakes, uh, but developing into uh, healthy young adults as opposed to the more helicoptered uh, approach that, that perhaps is done elsewhere that, that really <laughs> um, has them sitting in the backseat of their, their parents' car for a significant portion of their childhood. Um, it's the day after International Women's Day, and, and, and I think it's also important to note that um, women's mobility patterns are, are very different from men's, and uh, because cities are largely, uh, and still to this day, designed by and for the needs of men, um, that we often ignore 
um, the the mobility patterns of women. Again, this is not a, a blanket statement, but statistically, women are making uh, a larger portion of what we call care trips. That is the trips to school, to the grocery store, to take care uh, of other household tasks. Uh, and a lot of those care trips are made in a, a chain pattern, a spider web, uh, rather than directly from A to B. It's often from A, B, C, D, E, and, uh, and those trips are also more likely to be made in a more sustainable fashion, that is by foot, bicycle, and transport. And up to now, we've largely made commuting to and from the office a one-way, longer-distance trip. Uh, the, we've made that the priority. Uh, in our cities, and it's only when we start considering all those other different types of trips, those other modes of travel, that we can perhaps support those types of, of mobility patterns and, and make a more genderable, gender equitable, equitable mobility system. Um, this is uh, another perhaps surprising result of the cycling infrastructure here in the Netherlands. There's an assumption that not everyone can ride a bicycle and people uh, that cycling uh, disadvantages people with physical disabilities. Of course, not everyone can ride a bicycle, but I think once you get the design right and you make it uh, inclusive and you make it intuitive, uh, then you're quite surprised at the, the varying types of physical abilities, uh, people with physical abilities that are able to use your streets. And you see it every day here uh, in the Netherlands, people using adapted cycles, that is tricycles, hand cycles, uh, side by side, bicycles, um, tandem bicycles. Um, there are far more people that are willing and able to cycle under the right conditions um, than are potentially able to use an automobile. And even if they can't cycle, um, the uh, scoot mobile or, or a motorized wheelchair is quite popular here. You can see one in the bottom left corner. Uh, it's kind of a three wheeled mobility device. Um, can use the cycling infrastructure. And, and, and it's amazing to see uh, that, well, this is uh, Maya, a good friend of ours that has multiple sclerosis. She doesn't have a driver's license, but she's able to use the cycling infrastructure in and around Delft uh, to get from A to B, to take her kids to school, to get shopping, to attend university uh, in the nearby uh, city. Um, the cycling infrastructure makes her uh, uh, able to participate in society. And, and uh, when we're talking about uh, building bike lanes, perhaps we should be talking about this bigger idea of uh, mobility lanes rather than just the traditional old two-wheeled bike. Um, access to opportunity is another, I think, important topic, and, and especially in the United States. Uh, again, the, the, uh, the assumption that you are uh, economically able to own and operate a car uh, is, is quite problematic, uh, especially for lower income uh, populations. Uh, and uh, the last count, it was uh, 21, sorry, 12,000 US dollars per year uh, when you consider all the expenses that go into own and operate a car. And that's the cost of participating in society in a lot of places to be able to access housing, education, employment, uh, healthcare. Um, you have to own and operate a car and uh, only by providing more affordable options. And, and here in the Netherlands, it's, as I was saying earlier, the bicycle train or the bicycle public transport uh, combination that you're able to provide the same access to opportunity uh, without the economic burden of, of car ownership. And I think as, again, as gas prices continue to skyrocket, people are having to take out bigger and bigger loans to uh, own and operate a car. Uh, the very least we can do is provide them with a more uh, equitable and, and uh, uh, economically viable means to move around their city uh, rather than uh, burdening them with that uh, tremendous cost. And last but not least, the uh, well, the uh, the where we all end up eventually is the the twilight years, if you will, um, post retirement. There's this assumption that again that. Uh, people when they are uh, getting older in age that they can't cycle or won't cycle uh, and that they will need or want to uh, drive a car everywhere for their everyday needs. And, and what's really quite remarkable about the Netherlands is that actually the age group from 65 to 75 uh, is the one that cycles the most. And it just, um, yeah, it speaks to how not just safe and comfortable the streets have have been made, but also 
um, how cycling becomes a mean to a means another means to participate in society, uh, giving older people uh, access to their social connections, to their uh, their uh, health uh, connections, to their day to day lives. Uh, they're able to access without uh, driving a car. And, and inversely, when we live in a car dependent society, um, there is a, a point where we can't drive safely anymore. The, the American Automobile Association estimates that period is seven to 10 years on average where we shouldn't be driving because of our diminished eyesight and response times and physical capabilities. Within that period of time, um, we're either reliant on others for our transportation needs, we're either uh, housebound or uh, reliant on a pretty poor public transport system that that uh, shows up quite infrequently, or we're institutionalized. And uh, the the cycling infrastructure and the electric bike, specifically here, has allowed uh, the the elder generation here in the Netherlands uh, to not face those those challenges and allow them to age in place on the streets that they grew up and in the cities that they grew up. And this is what. Obviously, a lot of cities are striving for to allow their residents to age in place, but until we provide these mobility options, um, that becomes a very difficult task. So I always uh, end these presentations with this kind of existential question, uh, and I think it's uh, become all the more uh, clear post-pandemic. We are at a bit of an inflection point as a society where we continue to use our cars as a piece of personal protective equipment. Uh, and uh, especially with the advent, potentially the advent of autonomous uh, electric vehicles. This is a very uh, real proposal from the Peloton Corporation to give their customers an opportunity to exercise on their uh, way to work, uh, not ironically. Um, uh, but we really do, I think, uh, need to hopefully rebalance the space on our streets, reprioritize our mobility networks uh, to create more safe, social, uh, and, and age-friendly uh, streets so that we are able to get out there and, and ride a bicycle or roll on whatever uh, uh, vehicle makes sense to us. Um, because uh, without those voices, without that push for change, uh, the Silicon Valleys, the Elon Musks of the world, the, uh, the automobile industry, which is spending billions lobbying for the status quo, um, it, it could be quite a, uh, uh, a bleak, uh, uh, slightly dystopian uh, future for our cities as they become less and less friendly to the people that live there. So with that, I will uh, thank you for your attention. I will thank Alyssa again for having me. If you do have any questions that don't get answered in the Q&A, just reach out via dutchcyclingpuntnl.nl, sorry, and uh, um, yeah, if you want to talk more about a study visit, a workshop, or, or just a, a question for us or one of our experts, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. What a great presentation. Um, it's, always, it's always wonderful to hear about, you know, the policies and how the policies really get implemented in the Netherlands and discuss or start that discussion of what we can do here in the States, specifically in Florida to create safer facilities. Um, we have had quite a few questions pop in for you and I do anticipate more do come in, um, but let's get started on these. So the first one that I have is actually a three-part question. Um, what is the gas price comparison between here in the States and the Netherlands? The other parts of that are how do the parking costs compare and the cost of car ownership compare? So I don't know how you want to handle that one, but I will let you take that on. Sorry, I'm on mute. I'm Googling as we speak because um, I don't own a car and I, I couldn't tell you the price of gas. Um, but I, Google tells me it's uh, 7.8 euros per gallon. Um, what is that in US dollars? Good question. Eight dollars and sixty-one cents a gallon. So, what is it currently in in the United States? A lot less than that. Um, okay. It's still it's getting more expensive every day. I this morning I saw it at between four ten and four forty, depending on where you are. Again, this is in South Florida. The prices 
now in California are, and even New Jersey and New York are just much, much greater than that. But I mean, $8, that's, that's a lot. And I think everything that we see for gas prices is still thankfully under that mark. So um, it's definitely interesting. Do you know much about the cost of car ownership or anything over there? Yeah. Um, so the average cost of car ownership is uh, about 8,500 euros per year. So again, I'm going to convert that to US dollars and that comes out to 10,000 US dollars. Um, so that's actually less than the number I quoted uh, uh, insofar as 12,000. Um, so I'm not sure if, if, if it's a like for like comparison, it wasn't whether it was done by the same organization or not. Um, the cost of parking is also an interesting one. So it depends on whether it's short-term parking or long-term parking. Um, if you're traveling into the city center of Amsterdam or Delft or Utrecht, for example, um, you're probably paying about eight euros per hour. Um, so let's plug that in. That's uh, yeah, just over almost nine dollars US per hour. Uh, with no, I think there's a daily cap, but there's not really a um, kind of a. It is an, a flat hourly rate. Um, for on-street parking for residents, uh, there is, uh, everything is permitted. Um, I have looked into this and it's about hundred euros per year uh, just to park your car out on the street uh, in front of your house. Um, and um, if you want a second permit, uh, the costs skyrocket. So I think it's 300 euros for a second car and there's no option of, of getting a third car. <laughs> like it, it's just not a choice so um yeah i don't i don't know um too much because as i said i don't own a car and don't need a car <laughs> to live here um but uh there's no doubt that they're they're paying more uh to own a car but but it's worth pointing out that the the rate of car ownership here in the netherlands is virtually identical to france germany uk and other EU nations, it's just they're used a lot less, and, and especially for those shorter journeys. So um, there aren't a lot of uh, car-free families like myself. We're the exception to the rule, um, but it's, uh, yeah, a lot of the time they're just sitting there Monday to Friday unused, and then they're used on the weekends for uh, recreation or shopping. Great. And, you know, I'm just going to make a quick comment on that. We do have some other questions popping in, but I'd imagine that the cost of car ownership is also dependent on the size of the vehicle. And I'd imagine that the vehicle sizes over in the, in the Netherlands are probably a little smaller than some of the vehicle sizes we see here in the States. Um, I've seen that, you know, in what I've looked at in Europe studies. And Yeah, I think you pay, uh, again, I don't... <laughs> Uh, no firsthand, but but I think you pay, there's weight categories uh, in terms of the taxation. And, and as you get quite large, um, you pay quite, quite a bit, which means that only people who need these heavy trucks and vehicles for work are the ones that are, are paying that amount. They're not used for um, personal purposes as they are in many other places in the world. Awesome. So the next question, um, how difficult was it to enact the 15 minutes of cycling curriculum per week in school? And when did the Netherlands enact this? Um, the U.S. struggles with adding in more learning to an already packed curriculum. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I honestly don't, don't know. Um, you know, and and it's, it, there's a very good chance that it's kind of always been part of the, uh, the curriculum here, at least for the last 40, 50 years. Um, if you want to, uh, so the organization that, that uh, implements that, um, that curriculum is part of our network and I can uh, do some more digging and, and, and potentially connect you with them if you want to, um, some more information about that. Um, I, we can do this offline uh, because we have, for example, sample uh, booklets that they uh, that they give to the children, sample written tests um, and the like that we can 
they'll be in Dutch, but uh, we can do a, potentially a translation and, and uh, get those in your hands. But I know, um, based on my experience in Vancouver, um, it was a, uh, they did manage to get cycling curriculum into a lot of the schools there, but it was um, uh, an initiative of the city of Vancouver itself. Uh, and the schools had to opt in. So they said, we have this curriculum prepared. Uh, we have this funding secured. Um, if you want it, uh, it's available. And, you know, I think they potentially had 20, 25% of the schools uh, opt in to start and they're hoping to, to build it up from there. But um, it's not an area that I know a lot about, but I can, I can certainly uh, connect you to people that do if you'd like to learn more. Great. Yeah, I think that would definitely be helpful. I know that that is definitely something that at least our agency has as one of our goals um, to work with the school district down here to um, incorporate some sort of program like that with the understanding that we really need to educate everyone on uh, bicycle safety, but it really starts at the young children um, and that level. But the next question I have for you. So one barrier to cycling in my town of Boca Raton are these enormous six or eight lane roads like Glades Road, um, combined with the right on red rule. Crossing these roads on a bike is very dangerous and feels very dangerous. What can be done about this? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Uh, very good questions today. And you're almost, uh, you're stumping me on a lot of things. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, and again, I'm not an engineer, but uh, the approach here from the Netherlands would be to either um, design a physically protected crossing, that is, uh, continue the foot and cycle path uh, where possible through the intersection or to uh, uh, provide grade separation, that is, an underpass, a tunnel, or a, uh, a, a bridge, a raised uh, structure of some kind, uh, because the the intent there is to um, reduce the number of, of conflicts. So if you can, uh, and a lot of these, these fast cycling routes, the Snell Beach routes, um, there's great, great separation that takes place. So they uh, put the cycling routes uh, above or below the road. Uh, and that also reduces the amount of wait time for the drivers in terms of um, the cycling traffic that has to get off the road, uh, get across the road. And, 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 uh, obviously the, the easiest answer is to, um, uh, yeah, stop build, building roads like that in our cities. Um, but, but we have to work with the barriers that we're, we're given. Uh, and it's something actually we're, we're working with, um, the district of, uh, Columbia, Washington, DC right now, uh, to help them because they have not just a lot of these wide arterial roads, but train tracks and, and public transport right of ways that they're trying to get over and under and, and, and it's something that's done really well here in the Netherlands is um, infrastructure that uh, underpasses and, and, and bridges uh, to remove that conflict altogether and, and, and to give both modes of transport their own uh, smooth uh, way and, and reduce the, the, the conflict as much as possible. So um, yeah, there is... Um, what else? Uh, yeah, another workshop we did in, in Delaware, actually, that's that's quite interesting. Uh, and again, I can um, send you um, some more information on that. But basically, we work with the state DOT there. They picked the seven worst intersections in Delaware, uh, and they had a Dutch engineer kind of come up with a solution for each one. And it was very kind of they out of the box thinking, but they there's no kind of one single approach to this. Uh, but in some instances, yeah, it was grade separation. It was, uh, in other instances, it was a protected intersection or converting to a roundabout. Uh, but just looking at it from, from the Dutch perspective, um, I'm going to see, because they're all been archived and, and uh, um, you can go back and see all of the uh, solutions. Uh, and it's a, actually an annual uh, virtual conference that they now do every year and they invite uh, Dutch engineers. So it's intersections.bikede.org. Uh, can I, do I have access to the chat? 
No. Um, I think it's only Q and A, but if you send whatever, if you send it to me, I can send it out to everyone who's registered yeah. for this. So. Okay. Intersections.bikede.org, and you can watch all of the solutions uh, that the the Dutch engineers came up with. Awesome. Yeah, it's super interesting to think about. Um, you know, mitigating those safety concerns at intersections with having um, different levels, overpasses, underpasses, all of that, just thinking from the funding perspective of things um, and how we do things here, but definitely some great ideas and things that I'd love to, you know, see how we can implement um, in Florida. So my next question is, since most bicycle facilities are not physically separated in South Florida, what possible measures could be implemented to increase the bicycle awareness and acceptable culture in South Florida by vehicle drivers and to be more aware of bicycles on the roadway and share the road with cyclists? So really, I guess it comes down to what is the best way to really educate drivers in South Florida that bikes are allowed to be on the road, bikes are vehicles as well, and how to really get more, I guess, buy-in from the other uh, operators on the roadway and just respect. <laughs> I wish there was a loaded question. I know. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, it, it, I think it comes back to education in the classroom. It comes to starting um, not just bicycle safety, but larger question of traffic safety. The, uh, the kids here are taught, uh, you know, the rules of the road from a pedestrian's perspective, from a driver's perspective, from a uh, a uh, cyclist perspective, and in some instances, um, they actually have these traffic gardens, which are kind of uh, little playgrounds with uh, miniature road signs, road markings, and even little plastic cars for them to kind of test out some of these scenarios and uh, see the the road from a different perspective. Um, and then I think that permeates all the way up to the actual driver education system itself in terms of making sure the questions on the test, making sure that the, uh, the curriculum, the, uh, the, the classes that the drivers are taking before they get their license um, are making them fully aware of their responsibilities and, and, uh, and you know, maybe even putting in some questions about how roads are financed and uh, and, and, and the, uh, yeah, the, well, that, that cyclists are allowed to take the lane and, 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 and they have a right to exist on, on the road because there's a lot of, uh, misunderstanding and, and misinformation when it comes to that. Um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, I think there's a, a leadership role that the state, uh, uh that FDOT and, 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 the, the organizations with a lot of money and clout can, can take because, um, they potentially could do a marketing campaign, whether it's uh, television spots, uh, bus stop ads, and just to um, maybe not preach at people, but just to, to humanize uh, this, this road culture, because um, uh, there's a lot of the way the streets are designed that are putting us in competition with each other. And, 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 and people on bikes are just seen as kind of a, uh, getting in the way of everyone. Um, but trying to, I think, um, remind people that uh, they're just trying to get from A to B too, and that they also probably have a family and, and you know, hopes and dreams, and they're a living, breathing person as well, rather than just a, um, a, a road, road bump. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not easy. And, and uh, uh, but I think uh, it's, it has to be a priority because um, the implementation of a lot of these ideas and principles and, and the reallocation of road space requires political capital and you're not going to get that political capital without a certain percentage of buy-in from the, uh, from the community, from politicians and from, from the media and, and the business community. And, and you really have to, uh, do your outreach and your due diligence and bring them along. Otherwise, uh, you're just going to get opposition, uh, left, right, and center. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree with that for sure. Um, and it, you know, it is definitely worth noting that back in July of 2021, um, the state of Florida did actually pass Senate Bill 950, 
which did a couple of things. The first is that it introduced actual language for facility typology on the roadways. So now it's not just a bike lane. There is such thing in Florida statute as a separated bike lane, which is fantastic. I see that as a giant step in the right direction for bicycle safety and advocacy. Um, but also it did a couple other things. It changed a couple um, or some language in the legislature about movements and passing and really interactions between bicycles and cars on the roadway. But it also did um, or does require FDOT to do a very robust educational campaign um, that reaches everyone. Now, they haven't done that yet. Um, I'm very much awaiting that. But that is something that is in the pipeline to really just push out, you know, safe bicycling. And I think it'll do a lot of good in our communities um, for really just, you know, voicing that cyclists are humans as well as the operators of the vehicles. And we need to just, it's mutual respect on the roadway. Everyone's allowed to be on that space. Um, so definitely agree with what you were saying. Um, I do have two more questions. Um, and it doesn't look like anything else is popping in, but I will let you know if something does. So I will give you what looks like an easier question first. So what is the average kilometers per trip in the Netherlands and in our, or our, in our city? So um, I can answer a little bit based on what I know about South Florida, um, but what is the average length of a bicycle trip in the Netherlands? That was on my uh, e-bike slide. Let me just check that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the, an average normal bike journey is 3.6 kilometers. An average e-bike journey is 5.9 kilometers. Um, okay. I am going to have to do some quick research because I do not know how that converts to miles. <laughs> yeah, no. And this is, so I always come back to this fact that, um, and again, this is actually, this is going to be miles, but uh, I think two thirds of all car journeys in the United States are under five miles and, and half of all car journeys are under three miles. So it's, uh, you know, people might be traveling uh, longer distance for work potentially, but it's all those other journeys that people take throughout the day to uh, various other destinations in their neighborhood that where there is the potential for conversion to cycling or scooting or what have you. So, um, yeah, I think it's, and, and interestingly enough, I think the average distance to, from home to office here in the Netherlands is actually greater than in the United States, but that's only because we have so many choices here. Uh, and, and that's why I do a 65 kilometer commute from uh, Delft to Utrecht because uh, the train is so convenient. Uh, if I had to drive it, you know, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, of so people are actually, uh, paradoxically, they're, they're traveling further distances to work, but that's because the mobility systems are so convenient here uh, than they are in the United States. Yeah, I definitely see that. Um, and so I did that conversion. So 3.9 kilometers is about two and a half, a little more than that, um, miles, which is actually in line with what we see here. Um, most of the people that do cycle, not for leisure, but as a mode of transportation are doing that as that first last mile connection, which is typically between one and three, one and five miles. Um, and again, first last mile connection is to maybe a transit stop and then you take transit and then from where you get off of the bus or train to your final destination. It could also be, you know, riding to the grocery store to get some things. Um, but it's really important to, even in these small trips, to consider using a bicycle as a mode because the impacts on both your health and the environment and improving congestion on the roadways is just enormous. Yeah. Um, and I, I wish we had that network of transportation facilities right now um, you know, where we are in South Florida, but more just in general in the U.S. And I hope that that's something that we'll see in the, in the near future. Um, but I do have one last question for you, and then I guess uh, we can end the webinar. Um, so this question is, what is your opinion on the position of many departments of transportation in the States? That the safest place to ride is to be as far right as possible in a lane without a bike lane. 
specifically touching on visibility and lane widths with regards to safe passing distances when lanes would have to be made over 10 feet wide. So I guess a little background for this to kind of help you out because it looks like that is a very loaded question. So here in the States, part DOTs typically say, depending on the speed limit, the, the width of the road is gonna be 10, 11, 12 feet. It really depends on the land context, um, what's around there and just the speed and the design speed and all of that. Um, so with that being said, and in Florida statute, you know, if there's a bike lane, ride in it. If there's no bike lane, what you're supposed to ride is on that far right edge of the roadway. So you're closest to that sidewalk, but you're not quite on that sidewalk, you're still in the lane because you're still considered a vehicle. Um, this is what's considered safest by many DOTs and local governments, but what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that that is a safe place to ride visibility-wise um, given these circumstances? I hope that helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, this is way outside of my comfort zone in my area of expertise. Um, okay. yeah, and I'd be hesitant to really give, uh, um, a, a firm answer. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's interesting to see, uh, that kind of advice given out, uh, because it's, it's obviously made with trying to inconvenience cars as little as possible, right? It's, it's again, treating the bicycle as a uh, hindrance and, and uh, um, just trying to get it out of sight and out of mind. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, there's no scenario here in the Netherlands where you would be put in that position uh, because if, if traffic is moving that quickly, uh, then there's a legal requirement for physically segregated infrastructure. Um, so you're removing that, that conflict. And, and this is the larger problem with designing streets for cars and cars only is that you're creating all these types of unnecessary conflict. Um, and and uh, you can give all the advice you want, but people are going to move in a way that feels safe for them. And, and uh, if it's... If it's not following the guidance, then they're going to be seen as scoff laws and lawbreakers and uh, and the badly behaving uh, children of the <laughs> of the the uh, the road user family. So, um, yeah, it, it's uh, I think a very very difficult topic and and one I really would be hesitant to comment on uh, any more more than that. I appreciate your transparency with that. It is. It is definitely a, a tough topic and even something that we struggle with in our conversations and planning um, in the planning world down here. Um, and it really does you know, highlight that when we do plan our roadways, we're really planning with the preference for motor vehicles, which you know sometimes I struggle with in, in what I do because if we're planning for safety, we should be planning, at least in my perspective, for the people who have the less or the least protection around them. So those would be the people who are walking and biking. Um, so it's definitely an interesting perspective to think about um, and put out there. Now, I do have one question that, that kind of gave me, um, and you may or may not know the answer to this, but in the Netherlands, so you had mentioned that with a high speed limit, there is a requirement to have a segre segregated or separated bicycle infrastructure. Um, what would that speed limit be that requires that? 50 kilometers per hour. So it's uh, 30 miles. Okay. So that's really interesting. And in, in where we're at kind of down here um, in that we've acknowledged that, you know, 40 miles an hour, if you're a cyclist and you're hit at that speed, you're not likely to make it. 35 is still dangerous, but 30 is something that, um, you know, it's, that's a good speed to be aware of. So thank you for that. Hmm. Um, I definitely hope that we can incorporate that that limit or something similar to that in policies that we implement moving forward. Um, but with that, I don't see, I don't have any more questions. Um, so I would like to thank you, Chris, for your time this morning and this webinar. It's always great to work with you on these sorts of things and everyone for joining us. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy mornings to join us. Um, I would like to just invite everyone very quickly um, next when, 
Next Tuesday, we are going to be um, doing a webinar with um, actually one of the partners from the Dutch Cycling Embassy. Um, let me share my screen very quickly. We're going to be doing a webinar with Decisio, Matteo Jar from Decisio. And we are going to talk about bikeonomics um, and how um, adding infrastructure or bicycle infrastructure into our communities can really help improve the economics of the local communities. So I hope that um, you are all able to join us for that. And that is, um, as you see on the screen next Tuesday, March 15th from nine to 10.30. Um, and I look forward to hopefully having you join us. Um, and otherwise, again, thank you for taking your time this morning. Everyone have a good rest of your morning. And Chris, afternoon.